I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the New Zealand Edge Conference so far. Uh, my name is James Wright, and I'm part of the technical solutions team down here in Christchurch. And I'd like to welcome you to our stream session on imagery and drones in the ArcGIS platform. I've got with me today my colleague, Baldivane, who I'll let introduce himself. Yeah, welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, my name is Baldivane Bogart, and I'm part of the same technical solutions team at Ego, but I'm based in uh, Auckland. Cool. Thanks, Baldivane. Um, first off, I just wanted to get you familiar with the, the platform, which I'm sure you're all familiar with now. Uh, but just in case, if you want to ask a question, um, you can use the ask icon down in the bottom left hand of your uh, screen in the um, conference page. Um, we would try to answer all these questions uh, at the end of the session. Um, however, we might not get time. Uh, so if, if in that case, don't worry, we will still get to your answers. Um, it'll just be after the fact today. Um, but we will definitely follow up on all of your questions. Um, you can also use the note functionality in the platform to take any notes. Uh, remember to send these to yourself at the end of the session because they do stay on the platform. Um, and also these uh, recordings of the sessions today, as well as other sessions in the plenary will be available for two weeks um, from today. Cool. We've got a whole lot of content to cover today, so I'm going to jump into what we are going to cover. Um, first up, a bit of an energy platform overview and as well as a tech update from our friend Peter Becker from Esri. Uh, and then we'll be jumping in some drones in the ArcGIS platform. Uh, and then Valdivane will be taking us through some imagery management. Uh, we've got a couple of guest presenters, Tillman from Niwa and Ian Campion from ECAN to take you through some of their user experiences. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a bit of an imagery road ahead and a little bit of Q&A if we have any time. But first up, I'm going to hand over to Peter Becker. Uh, who I mentioned is a group product manager from for imagery at Esri. Uh, he's going to give an overview of imagery within the ArcGIS platform, as well as a few other highlights of what's new. I'll let T Peter take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Becker. I'm the group product manager for imagery at Esri. It's great to have this opportunity to connect with you today at the New Zealand Esri User Conference and present a quick overview of the imagery capabilities of ArcGIS. The imagery and remote sensing capabilities are foundational components of ArcGIS and integrate to create a comprehensive imagery platform. There are so many different capabilities that it's simplest to break this down into five key capabilities. Content, which refers to the massive volumes of imagery that you may have already collected or intending to collect or want to access from ArcGIS Online or the Living Atlas. Image management, which refers to how to manage this imagery and make it accessible to the many applications. Map production from imagery, which refers to how to generate products such as author photos, elevation models, and 3D mesh from imagery. Imagery analysis, which is related to the extraction of information from imagery and includes aspects such as deep learning. And lastly, visualization and exploitation, which refers the creation of interactive user interfaces that enable users to quickly visualize and analyze imagery in a wide range of desktop, web, and mobile applications. In this presentation, I'm going to go into more details on each of these five subcategories. So, starting with content, ArcGIS supports all forms of imagery and rasters. This includes lots of different formats of imagery, as well as imagery that comes from different sensors, be it satellite, aerial, drones, and terrestrial sensors. We also support multiple modalities, includes you know, author photos, natural color author photos, but also categorical data, elevation data, LIDAR, radar, multidimensional data. So lots of let's say, modalities of data. And then imagery coming in different forms, not only as local files or cloud storage, but also through web services specifically those, for example, coming to the Living Atlas. And this includes a wide range of data sets such as Landsat and Sentinel and the world elevation. So all sorts of content can be easily integrated and used within ArcGIS. Next, let's have a look at about how imagery is accessible. You may have a collection of images and you may just directly connect in a local hard disk uh, and display the imagery in a desktop application such as Arc, um, ArcGIS Pro. Um, but what you probably want to do is to work with large collections of imagery. And this is really where the Mosaic data set comes to the fore. Mosaic data set allows you to take a collection of images and define references to those images in a database. 
Uh, this could be referencing satellite imagery, orthos, elevation models, all the different types of data. Um, the data can be in multiple projections, pixel sizes, and bit depths, and different bands. And what's brought into the database is not the pixels, but all the meta information, as well as the definitions of how to transform that imagery from what's stored on disk into the products that you want. We refer to this sometimes as the on-the-fly processing and dynamic mosaicing capabilities. And then the mosaic data set can be viewed either as a global, a single mosaic or as individual images that can be directly accessed. And these pixels are then processed as they are accessed. So the mosaic data set stores the transformations and then as RTS accesses the images, those pixels are transformed into the different products. So, but how do we actually extend that beyond a desktop application? And that is to serve that same mosaic data set into RTS Enterprise. So through RGS Enterprise, um, you can set up RGS Enterprise and that has various components such as the portal and RGS server, the data stores, and you can set up as part of RGS Enterprise image server and that can serve out the data as dynamic image services, enabling you to access the imagery with the ser server performing all the processing, or it also provides raster analytics. And I'll get a little bit more details into that a bit later, but it really allows massive processing of the imagery. So the image server provides its dynamic imagery capability, tiled imagery, which is sort of streaming of tiles, hosted imagery, which is the ability for a user just to upload an image into ArcGIS Enterprise and then have access to it, author mapping, which is the capability to process the imagery into products, and then raster analytics, which is this uh, massive processing of imagery that's available. So it has a lot of capabilities. And those all then become accessible as services that become you know, usable by the, the various applications. Another alternative is to actually take that imagery and in ArcGIS Pro, convert it to tile cache and load it into ArcGIS Online as essentially simple tile cache or sort of simple base maps. And this has been available for, for a, number of, a number of years and used extensively. What's coming up later this year as part of ArcGIS Online imagery is actually the ability to take the imagery and actually upload the imagery, not only the cache, but elevation data, multi-spectral data, upload that into ArcGIS Online, and you can access it as stream tile imagery, as dynamic imagery with on-the-fly processing, and also able to then perform different types of analysis, such as classification of the imagery. So all this really enables you to implement ArcGIS either on-premise or in multiple ways in the cloud environments. Another area of interest is what we call multi-dimensional master data sets. I've just told you a little bit about mosaic data sets as a way of defining these overlapping stacks of images. But in many cases, people really want to work with multidimensional rasters, which very often are pixel aligned cubes. Now, you can load that imagery into a mosaic data set, and a mosaic data set will allow you to access any slice of that image. And a mosaic data set is or can be defined as a multidimensional mosaic data set. And that means you can use it with the various applications within ArcGIS. And you could, for example, do a temporal profile through that but the system would have to go and open behind the scenes all these different images. So what we have is the ability to create what we call a multidimensional CRF. This to take a subset of a mosaic data set and actually persist it as, let's say, a cube of data where everything is already pre-aligned, the same pixel size. It has some limitations, but it enables you to very quickly look through different slices. And then what we do is have the transpose option, which you can think of just rotating this cube on its side. And once you've implemented that, you get very fast temporal access to imagery. So let's have a look at a demo. Here I am in ArcGIS Pro. And if I go to my catalog, I can see I have an ACS connection. It's actually a connection to cloud storage. So I'm gonna connect directly to a CRF file in the cloud and I can literally drag and drop it into um, ArcGIS Pro. So this should bring up the imagery pretty quickly. So here is, the, um, here is the data set being displayed. I can now go and let's say, change the appearance and change it to DRA. Um, this data set is actually massive. It's, a, it's over a terabyte in size. Uh, it actually contains eight different, seven different variables, uh, including things like maximum temperature for every day for 40 years at a one kilometer resolution over the whole of the United States. Uh, so I could pick let's say a particular date, let's say zoom into a particular area and it'll extract that information and display it. Then uh, 
I can go, for example, identify and let's say get the temperature at that particular point. Uh, but what if I actually want to have a profile of all the temperatures? I could actually go to the temporal profile tool and um, select a point and literally just drop a point. And what this is actually going to do is actually go through all the data sets extremely rapidly and extract all the temperatures over time. So here we see basically a graph, so sort of going through time, looking at how temperature fluctuates every day for 40 years. Now I might say I don't want it every day. Uh, let's say I only want it every, let's say, month uh, for the year. Similarly, I basically just click another point and it's now going to basically nearly instantaneously extract that information. That's quickly showing how we can work with massive terabyte sized files, even if they're stored in cloud storage and access not only a slice, um, but also quickly do a temporal profile. And then if you look at the multi-dimensional tools, uh, you will see there are a whole load of additional tools that can be used for doing things like trend analysis and anomaly detection or aggregating the data set. So there's a quick overview of some of the capabilities of not only accessing multi-dimensional data, but then being able to work with multi-dimensional data. Okay, so next we have map production from imagery. Um, RTS provides four sets of tools that work with various types of imagery. Uh, we have site scan, uh, which not only provides the ability to um, fly drones and pilot them, and perform fleet management, it allows you to really take imagery or drone imagery uploaded into the cloud and have uh, processing performed in the cloud to create a range of imagery products, including author photos and 3D meshes and point clouds. Um, but it's really a SaaS offering. We have drone to map which is more of a sort of a standalone application uh, designed more for organizations who want to go into the field, take their drone out, fly the data and process the data in a, let's say a desktop environment. Uh, then we have author mapping, which integrates with ArcGIS Pro uh, and provides the ability to process not only drone imagery, but aerial imagery and satellite imagery and create author photo and digital train model products. And then there's AuthorMaker, which is actually a component of ArcGIS Image Server. And what that allows you to do with, it provides a user interface, a web user interface for working with drone imagery. So all these products process different types of drone, aerial, or satellite imagery and integrate very cleanly with ArcGIS Online, Pro, and Image Server. This is just a slide to show a representation, for example, an agriculture application uh, where you can see the location of where the drone took the pictures. You can see, in this case, a terrain model, or you can actually process that into a multi-band, four-band um, image um, to perform more detailed analysis within ArcGIS. Let's look into our image analysis. ArcGIS has an extensive set of capabilities for uh, performing all types of um, image analysis. Um, so this includes things like deep learning, classification, uh, doing spectral analysis, change detection. I mentioned previously a little bit about the multi-dimensional analysis, but then also doing things like map, map algebra, suitability analysis. This is really extending the, the, the huge archive and of, of processing capabilities that um, Esri has um, in multiple applications. So these can be accessed within the image analyst extension. Uh, many of them are actually available in ArcGIS Pro directly or the spatial analyst extension. And they all run within ArcGIS image server as well, uh, which can then obviously be accessed to the APIs and map viewers. Uh, a lot of this based on raster functions. Uh, we have about 163 at the moment uh, raster functions available within ArcGIS. Uh, these can be uh, Street, um, chained together to create different processing chains. So you can take these functions, chain them together, and performs all types of processing analysis on, on your imagery. They're broken up into different groups depending on the, the product that you have, whether you have just ArcGIS Pro, Image Analyst Extension, or Spatial Analyst Extension. And one thing to note is the actual Python master functions as well, which enable you to really use NumPy arrays and SciPy and actually create um, in Python algorithms and processes which can be configured to run directly within this environment. So it's extremely extensible. Um, there are a lot of these raster functions. Um, some of them are you know, more simplistic things like doing simple calculations, but they can be quite advanced 
uh, functions, doing things like distance functions or uh, performing um, you know, spatial uh, functions to do things like anomaly detection or multidimensional functions that do things like predict predictions. These functions are now also available through not only the RGS Pro, but through the Map Viewer. In the Map Viewer, if you have RGS Enterprise, you will actually see that you can, uh, if you have Image Server, you can pick on an image and bring up these function chains and apply functions directly in the web browser, and those processes will actually be sent to the server to be processed and return, return those results directly to you. So this is a great capability, which is now actually in ArcGIS Online imagery and also going to be available directly in the web in ArcGIS Online. A little, thing, a little bit about the Python APIs. Um, so ArcGIS supports Python in many ways. Uh, we have ArcPy, which is really a comprehensive, you know, capability, comprehensive list of about 1,300 uh, pools, uh, which really are foundational tools for performing all types of analysis. And then on top of that, we actually have the ArcGIS API for Python, which is really an additional, or it's really an additional, you know, 2,300 methods and functions that can then be uh, utilized and accessed through, for example, notebooks, um, but also directly in web applications or in, in ArcGIS Pro as well. A little bit more on the types of image processing and analysis we do, and includes obviously things like classification, your, your traditional supervised and unsupervised classification using, let's say, pixel-based as well as object-based or segment-based segment classification. And there are lots of different classifiers. And we actually have a very nice wizard that actually helps you through the whole process. It includes things like the accuracy assessment tools so you can really understand how, how good the classification was. Massive amount of deep learning that's gone into the product over the last few years. Um, this is not Esri developing our own AI algorithms. It's really Esri integrating with the incredible wealth of AI algorithms that exist and making sure that they work with the different types of data. So how do you actually apply you know, deep learning against not only satellite imagery, but elevation data, LIDAR data, asymmetry data, and then perform these different types of tasks that you may be interested in, um, either you know, classifying pixels using deep learning, you know, doing image classification, object detection, as well as things like super resolution, which is really to improve the apparent visualization or the resolution of the images by using AI to enhance the imagery. Multidimensional analysis is another area that we've worked a lot on over the last year. Um, this now includes a lot of tools, not only the, the profile tool that I showed before, but things like anomaly detections, uh, trend analysis, which includes things like harmonic regression, and then predictive analysis, which is to really sort of extend that out into the future. Um, one of the things that we worked on also is in various types of change detection. Um, so this includes the change detection not only between two images, but also a stack of images to use something called CCDC that allows us from a stack of images to determine when exactly certain changes took, um, occurred within the imagery. So this is a great cap capability for working with these sort of stacks of imagery that I was referring to. Our REST analytics is really the ability of how that scales. Now, the capabilities that we have run in RGS Pro directly. Uh, some of these processes can be extremely large. Uh, so if you have RGS Enterprise, you can configure image server to run REST analytics. And what that will do is we'll take that job. It can be submitted from RGS Pro or a web application and split it up into lots of smaller jobs, which are distributed over multiple compute, enabling these processes to be run extremely quickly. Uh, it utilizes not only distributed compute, but also distributed storage, and then actually compiles all the results back together again. This allows you to really significantly reduce the time that would normally take to do processing over at high resolution over very large extents. So let's move on to visualization exploitation. Um, this is really the ability to you know, take the imagery and utilize it in multiple ways. Um, this could be within um, um, applications within ArcGIS, such as ArcGIS Pro and Excalibur, um, but there are also a lots of different um, applications that, um, that utilize imagery. Uh, so, for example, within Pro, you have the ability, to, if you have stereo imagery, to display and work with stereo imagery. Uh, we have the ability in ArcGIS Pro also to work with oblique imagery. This is especially good for sort of satellite imagery, um, sort of oblique satellite imagery. Uh, oriented imagery is the ability to work with um, imagery that's, let's say, terrestrial imagery or high oblique imagery. 
um, motion imagery works with um, you know, videos that typically come from drones. Typically, it's for um, data that's called what's called MISB compliant. In other words, it has embedded into the video uh, the various orientation and location information of that video, and that works um, to enable interpretation, good interpretation of that. And then also the multi-dimensional data sets. So how do we interactively work with multi-dimensional multi data sets? So those all work in, for example, RGS Pro. Um, so RGS Pro itself has a lot of capabilities for working with imagery. Uh, what we've also um, released over, just over a year ago was RGS Excalibur. Um, so this is really a web application for structured observation management. Uh, so the ability to have numbers of users working and um, let's say identifying features in imagery and correctly annotating them. Uh, RGS Earth provides really a 3D immersive experience um, for working 3D data sets. And then there are the field operations and apps. Going even further, obviously there are story maps. Hopefully many of you have already used story maps and those can integrate, integrate imagery. There are configuration templates. Uh, these really make it easy to take an image service and create an application out of it. For example, if you want to uh, have an application to look at a change or um, to do something what we call visit, in other words, to go to multiple locations and check, you know, is it, does it conform, is the ground control correct, uh, or is the result of, let's say, deep learning correct. Application builders allow you to um, build up um, applications through widgets. Uh, and then obviously the custom web apps, you can use the JavaScript APIs to create your own web applications. All the stuff about imagery is very well documented. Uh, we also provide the imagery workflows website. You can see the URL there. Definitely recommend you go and have a look at it. And there's a lot of workflows which provide, which really aggregate together lots of different resources that are available within the platform, including the tutorials and helps help it really provides a whole lot of best practices um, on how to work with imagery. So do take a look at that. It's a, it's a very, very good resource. So that's really a conclusion, an overview. As I said, we've gone through the different components, how RTS works with the content, how we manage the data, how we can produce different products from it, perform the analysis and things like AI on the imagery, and then perform the visualization exploitation. So I hope that was of useful. Thanks for that, Peter. Uh, as you can see, there really are some exciting imagery capabilities within the ArcGIS platform. Peter just touched on the five core capabilities of imagery within the platform. For the rest of the presentation, we will take you through a bit of a deeper dive into each of those capabilities. But first up, map production, and more specifically, how drones are used in map production. Hey, James, Reece quickly, can you maybe share your screen? Ooh. Sorry, I was not shared. Ah, that makes sense. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> cool. And we'll, um, we'll jump straight into map production and more specifically how drones are used in map, in map production. Recently formed are what's called drone collections, an assembly of different apps and processes that allow you for an end-to-end -end drone data workflow. It starts with the site, scanning, the site scan flight planning application, which you briefly saw on this morning's plenary. I'm going to go into more detail shortly, but essentially what the app enables you to, to do is plan and autonomously capture high quality drone imagery. We then move to the process, manage and analyze phase where they're, where they're offering varies depending on your use case as well as scale. I'm going to take a look at each of these in more detail. In, in the slides after this. And finally, disseminating through the ArcGIS platform, which are all sure, I'm sure you are all familiar with now. We'll take a look at this complete workflow in a demo I've got prepared for you in about five minutes. But first, drone to map. It is designed for a, to be a, a single desktop application, designed mainly for uh, smaller, um, operations with one, maybe two pilots that all runs off your own desktop application. The application is designed for both online and offline use, and it creates uh, image products such as 2D author mosaics, uh, digital elevation models and surface models, as well as importantly, 3D point clouds and meshes. 
For those of you that are familiar with ArcGIS Pro, drone to map is essentially a stripped down version of that specifically designed for drone processing. It's got some basic analysis tools, including volume calculations, measurement tools, as well as developing your own spectral indices such as NVDI. And with a click of a button, you can share directly to ArcGIS Online, as well as ArcGIS Pro to continue analysis. Next up, we have ArcGIS Pro Ortho Mapping, as well as the uh, extensive analysis available in ArcGIS Pro. It too is a specific desktop application that's available on both online and offline. Uh, it can create 2D ortho mosaics, as well as DEMs and DSMs, but importantly, it doesn't create those point clouds and 3D meshes like drone to map does. This uh, ortho mapping capability is not just designed for drone to map, it's for it not designed for drone mapping specifically. You can also do historic and aerial imagery management here as well. What's particularly good about this uh, application is that you can manage large sets of data uh, with mosaic data sets, which uh, Peter just mentioned briefly. You can also automate the processes, um, your drone image processes with Python as well as Model Builder. And of course, ArcGIS Pro has extensive imagery analysis, such as raster functions, image classification, and the new pixel editor. And of course, you can share directly to online and image server. Finally, I'll take you through OrthoMaker, which is a ArcGIS enterprise specific application, and it also requires image server. So reasonably high requirements for this application. It's a simple web, web application interface, so it's obviously online only. It creates 2D author mosaics, as well as digital elevation and digital surface models. So again, no 3D, 3D product creation here. It too has got an intuitive, easy to use web interface, and it's also got some automation functions as well. What's great about this application is it uses your own uh, enterprise deployment to uh, spread out the processing of that drone data um, so that takes the pressure off your own uh, personal machines. However, I want to take a look at the fourth option in a bit more detail, the new site scan for ArcGIS offering, a complete software as a solution uh, offering that Esri recently acquired at the start of the year. This demo is going to take you through the complete end-to-end -end workflow using the, the flight manager, as well as processing in the web application, and then sharing out onto ArcGIS Online. Let's take a look now. One of the things that companies want to achieve when conducting drone flights is really high image quality, so they get the best picture they can of their current site. Another thing that they want to achieve is repeatability of that flight data. So being able to easily fly the same location over and over again. And finally, reducing the level of entry for pilots. This reduces training costs as well as reduces time in the field taken to be able to conduct those flights. This application aims to do all of those things by giving companies the ability to pre-plan their flights, either with analysts in the office or drone pilots themselves in the field. Let's take a look at an example now. In this example, we have a construction roading project that we want to fly multiple times to get an up-to-date picture of how the site is tracking. The site has already been previously flown and a, and a flight plan has been saved to the project and shared across our organization. When we take a look at it, we can see that the latest ortho mosaic has been downloaded from the cloud and brought into our site scan application, giving us an up-to-date picture of what's going on in the field. So what if I'm in an offline environment, you may ask? Don't worry, the application's got you covered there too. Once you've created a pre-planned flight, the application gives you the ability to download that underlying imagery base map of your site area. Here I can see that same area just for my roading project.
flight plan itself is also downloaded so I can operate in a fully offline environment. Now, with just a couple of clicks, my drone pilot is ready to take off. They could just need to check their original flight settings to make sure that they don't need to change anything, and they're ready to go. This touches on that ease of use factor, reducing the level of entry for drone pilots to be able to fly, but also reducing costs for training them. Time and efficiency is also improved on. As you can see at the bottom there, it only takes 16 minutes to survey this large area, reducing time on site. Data quality is also touched on with an expected resolution of 1.7 centimeters per pixel, allowing personnel to see even the finest details. Repeatability is also covered through saving the flight plan to the project. Now as my drone goes and completes this flight, let's jump over to SciScan Manager while my drone data is processing, I thought I'd take you through some of the highlights of SiteScan for ArcGIS Web Manager. So first off, it's a web application, meaning that it's a lightweight application that just sits in your browser, meaning you don't need a special machine to be able to run it. It's a complete analysis and collaboration tool, so you can do your volumetric calculations and area measurements, as well as share links to people within your organization or other key stakeholders that need to see that data. It's got direct integration with ArcGIS Online portal and also Autodesk BIM 360, enabling you to collaborate and share data across different platforms with one click. It's got features such as inspection and volume reports, generating professional documents at the click of a button. It's got fleet management, allowing you to keep track of the drones you're using, as well as the personnel flying them, which we'll take a look at in a second. And finally, unlimited cloud storage and elastic processing, meaning that you can store unlimited amounts of drone imagery and elastic processing, meaning that you're not going to have to wait when you upload large amounts of data to the cloud. Here we are, back in SiteScan for ArcGIS Web Manager. And I thought I'd start with a little bit of administration that the application allows. Here we can view multiple different projects that are happening simultaneously. Each project can have its own number of members that are working on that project, for example. I can manage the members of my organization, depending on their permission levels. Another great feature is fleet management that I mentioned earlier. Here I can keep track of multiple different drones and see how many flights they've completed, who were they last flown by, and when that flight last was. Also, I can keep track of the different batteries that those flights use to really keep on top of my fleet and all of the different components of it. This is a particularly useful feature, especially as an organization begins to grow their drone operation. It allows to keep track of everything all in one place. My imagery has now finished processing. As you can see here, that raw drone data has been processed into three different image products. This awesome mosaic that you can see here, as well as a point cloud and a 3D mesh that we'll take a look at in a second. The digital elevation model is also underlying this 2D awesome mosaic, as you can see in this elevation model. That leads me nicely onto measurement tools within the site scan manager. All the tools are designed to be intuitive to use, meaning that you don't need to be a special analyst anymore to be able to work with this data. That also links in with the fact that this is a web application, meaning that you don't need specialist hardware to be able to perform any of these measurements anymore. That means that anyone with it throughout your organization can come in here and access this raw uh, drone data. So for example, a roading manager could come in and draw a simple volume measurement of the stockpile that they are particularly interested in. Simply draw around the stockpile and they gain valuable insights into the exact cut and fill of this. That same manager may then generate their own volume report to show people that need to see it or simply share a link to be able to view this measurement. All of this allows for self-service throughout your organization, 
taking pressure off valuable resources that may not need to do these tasks. Similarly, 3D measurements are just as simple as in the Site Scan Manager. We have access to similar tools such as calculating heights of features within the point cloud. All of this is really useful to be able to gain an accurate sense of what's on site at this current point in time. All of this imagery data and analysis is really useful in its own right. However, that's not where the workflow ends. All of this data is particularly useful when you bring it into a GIS where you can enhance this data by bringing in other contextual layers to bring more insight of what's happening on this work site. Here we are inside ArcGIS Online, inside a scene viewer with a nice looking web application around the side of it. We now have these same image products available to us, the author mosaic, point cloud, as well as a digital surface model. What's great about the ArcGIS Online platform is that it now allows us to bring in contextual information. In this example, I've got a local water supply that I can bring in as a layer. This might be particularly useful in a roading project, understanding exactly where pipes are, for example. Having all these image products inside of a easy to use web application also allows for self-service of those key stakeholders that need to see this information. They can come in and create their own measurements and interrogate exactly what they want to see without having to go to analysts every time. And what's great about this lightweight web application is it's easily shared across stakeholders, across organizations with a simple link. This has been a relatively simple example of what sort of information you can bring inside ArcGIS Online to give added value to your stakeholders and across your organization. I want to take a look now at a similar product, a more of a custom web application that takes a look at the life cycle of a construction project, bringing in drone imagery as well as CAD data. Here we have an example of a web application customized using the ArcGIS JavaScript API. The application allows you to view previous drone flights over varying periods of time, allowing you to see the progress of this construction project. The application also allows you to view 3D texture meshes as well as those 2D author mosaics to really get a sense of how the project is tracking. The particular great thing about this application is that I can bring in that BIM data of the actual building itself. This allows you to check the progress of the building project when comparing the building, the building model and the textured mesh data. The application also allows for further self-service in the form of measuring whatever's on the site at the time. Overall, this is a fantastic example of how the ArcGIS platform can integrate multiple different data types, in this case, drone data and CAD and BIM data into one application to provide great value to key stakeholders that need to view this construction project. Cool. And there you have it, a complete end-to-end -end drone data workflow using SiteScan for ArcGIS. Again, we could have replaced uh, that processing with any of the three tools I showed you before, drone to map ArcGIS Pro, as well as AuthorMaker. What I wanted to go through next is a little bit of a roadmap of where SiteScan is heading to next with a couple of new features. Um, first up is quick capture integration. It's shown in the top right animation on the right. This update will allow users to use drone, the drone's location within the quick capture application. This then allows you to use that big button mapping uh, application to map out any areas that you uh, deem worthy. Uh, think examples such as fire perimeters or identifying uh, features that are in hard to reach areas. Another great upcoming addition in the flight planning application is the addition of the world elevation service. This feature, terrain follow, will cause flights to adapt to hilly terrain to maintain a constant flight altitude. 
This allows for consistent imagery capture and imagery accuracy, image accuracy across the survey site. The flight planner is also gaining the ability to output flight logs that are designed to be used inside ArcGIS Pro's full motion video tool. For those that have used this tool, you will know that the flight logs need to be in a quite a specific format for this tool to work. So this is a great improvement for ease of use. Finally, the list of accepted drones with the flight planning tool will be growing as more drones are tested and added to the application. With that, I'll pass on to Bowdervane for some imagery management. Yeah, thanks, James. Great overview of uh, what is uh, possible with the uh, drones in the, in the platform. Um, and I want to uh, quickly talk about imagery management, but not too long before we go to our um, uh, first user story of this session. Um, imagery management, it, it is, as you heard, one of the core capabilities of RGS, and it gets even more important when you're uh, collecting large amounts of imagery, whether that's imagery that comes from drones, planes, or satellites. Having good data management uh, allows you to make better use of all the data. And it's not always just putting your raw imagery into a mosaic data set, publish it, and expect it to work. In order to make the best use of your imagery, you sometimes need to do some processing of the data in order to make it work and make it performant. For example, when you're hosting your imagery uh, from native cloud storage, storage you'll want to optimize it for that. Uh, and Esri has some uh, formats that work really well, whether you uh, just want to view uh, imagery or if you want to do analysis on the imagery data as well. You may also want to use raster functions to allow the end user to make better use of the data. And for people who have, haven't been to the spatial analysis uh, session before, um, or for the people who have been there, you saw some of the analysis that NIWA is doing uh, with their Seacoast and Estuaries app. Uh, if you haven't seen that, uh, you can watch it later on the platform uh, for the next two weeks. But now we will go to uh, Tilman Steinmetz from NIWA, and he will talk about uh, the imagery side of things uh, for the uh, Seacoast and Estuaries app. Yeah, well, um, my name is Tillman. I want you to see a new app that we've built for a project called Seas Coasts Estuaries New Zealand, or simply Seams for short. It was co-funded in equal parts by EnviroLink and Niwa. I think that it is a pretty unique combination of working with a large, com uh, large uh, volume of raster data in an easy to use web application in order to do pretty advanced data analysis. This makes it useful for resource managers and scientists alike, and hopefully a few others too. In this second part of my presentation, I want to allow you to have a backstage look of the management which was used to get the data holdings ready for the scenes web. If you haven't seen part one, I would like to encourage you to have a look at the recording to understand what the app's functionality is. It gives users access to display and analyze currently over 1,600 raster datasets which have been derived from MODIS satellite imagery. My colleague, Matt Pinkerton, has used IDL to derive various ocean quality parameters, and I had the task to convert that stack of rasters into something usable via a web app. Water quality parameters, such as phytoplankton biomass, water clarity, temperature, suspended sediment, etc., are available. The web app enables users to select an area and time span of interest for efficient e extraction of water quality products to then either download or um, for external analysis or using online tools that provide further statistical analysis and graphical interpretation. So with the derived drivers <coughs> that Matt produced, we ended up having our, a number of individual ocean parameter products and hundreds of NetCDF files on a network drive that needed to be made available through the app. So how do you deal with all those rasters in a web app? We used Python scripts to add groups of rasters to mosaic data sets. Then we ran, um, then we associated so-called raster function chains with those mosaic data sets that run predefined computations on the fly when a user triggers them. These can be used among many other things to derive raster representations such as classifications. And we can also use them to assign different rendering options to the group of rasters for the different parameters. The screenshot in the upper right corner shows how these processing templates can be accessed inside ArcGIS Pro. They basically become a part of the mosaic data set. 
Finally, we published the Mosaic dataset as a single image service that can be queried from the application. Whenever new datasets for this project are put into an agreed file location, we can run a Python process that synchronizes these new datasets into the Mosaic dataset, so they appear in the raster catalog table. So at this point, we basically have a handle for all rasters from a database that we can interact with using queries for a range of attributes and which can be displayed using the image service as a container. The raster function templates define the visualization and can be interacted with using RESTful services. This is a more detailed view of the process that I've just described. The image service is also used to facilitate the aggregation of multiple groups of rasters and making the data available as published secured ArcGIS server image services. Here's an overview that shows a schematic of the workflow that we've used to combine and publish individual raster sources into a single image service. Don't be misled by the, by the graphic on the right side. It, um, think of it as basically a single image service that has been published to provide access to all the rasters which are grouped um, for different parameters on the left side. The process is like this. First, multiple child mosaic datasets are created. Each stores all the rasters for one parameter. The children are then added to a parent mosaic dataset. Finally, a reference mosaic dataset is created as a view of the parent, and that is then published as one image service. The functions shown on some of the icons here indicate um, raster functions which have been associated with those datasets and can be accessed via the web. The functions can be applied on the fly, meaning that whenever you calculate a new output using a, an associated function, that doesn't create any persistent output. This provides a very powerful data model which you can use to work with large volumes of rasters. I would like to talk about using NetCDF data in image services. At least half of the projects I work on at New are used the NetCDF data format. Almost everything that comes out of the models in New supercomputer is in a NetCDF file. Now, ESRI have made great progress for those working with multidimensional data and NetCDF files. The Mosaic dataset as a container handles NetCDF data ingestion, storage, and retrieval. Metadata stored inside the NetCDF file are directly read into the Mosaic dataset catalog. Live updates using the synchronized process allow services to be kept running 24 seven while updating the contents of the image service. So that all sounds like it should be no problem at all to use the data in Esri image services just as they are created in the supercomputer. Well, in fact, it almost sounded too good. Sure enough, in our initial tests, we realized that the NetCDF data were slow to draw or query from. So we researched some other data format alternatives. This is the process that we came up with. Some pre-processing needs to happen first. Initially, the files are renamed automatically so that the name encodes the water quality parameter and the time. We later use the file name to enable searching and finding them more easily in the application once those are written to the raster catalog table. This is required because we no longer have access to the metadata once we convert file from NetCDF into another format. Images are then pre-processed for the application by converting them from NetCDF to NASA's meta raster or MRF format. Lastly, in the process, we also compress each raster using Esri's open sourced LERC algorithm, which stands for Limited Error Raster Compression. Let me talk about MRF and LERC a bit more. So, to improve access performance of the rasters, we apply two workflows in one script. While the NetCDFs are converted into the meta raster format container, a newly evolving image storage format that is optimized for cloud as well as enterprise environments, we also apply an ESRI compression algorithm to the rasters called LERC, which stands for Limited Error Raster Compression and that provides faster access to imagery and rasters. With LERC, we're able to define the permitted level of error incurred by the compression. So this is a lossy algorithm, but we can tell it how much loss is allowed. 
we can then tweak it to compress the raster sufficiently while still returning data at a sufficient level of accuracy. Lurk's very efficient algorithm results in very low processing requirements with very good compression. You can search GeoNet for an article by Peter Becker from Esri um, about MRF and Lurk. A tool to apply the conversion and um, compression algorithm is called Optimized, raster, optimized Rasters and is published by Esri. Great, so we've got an image service that accesses compressed rasters in a file system. We can do searches on the image service because we have attributes in a catalog table that we can use for filtering, etc. That is all very easy, isn't it? <clears throat> well, after our initial excitement about the fact that we were able to actually query our data sets all via a single image service, we found that performance still wasn't too good. After considering various options, we determined that what we would need to use was yet another format called a transposed CRF or cloud raster format, uh, format storage. So um, this essentially transposes the, the entire data cube to make it faster to query it along the time axis. And um, it, it is a functionality which was not available until version 10.8.1 of ArcGIS Enterprise was released at the end of July. So we had to upgrade as quickly as possible to enable this. By using this transposed form of our parent mosaic data set and image service, we achieved a very significant performance gain. In fact, exporting pixels is now about a hundred times faster than using the original image services. It basically just means that we have one image service which is used for um, regular um, display and animations and the other uh, service is used for the export part where we run um, a get samples rest request and write the pixels into memory and from there into an R tool or into a CSV file. Before finishing, um, I, I would like to talk about Mosaic dataset creation. If you work with rasters, you've probably created mosaic datasets before, and it seems to be a straightforward thing to do interactively in ArcGIS Pro. However, if you need to create many of them while making sure that their configuration matches exactly that of the others, it becomes more diff difficult. Essentially, we're talking about setting up and configuring a high performance container or database for rasters. If you've done such a manual configuration, you will know that many configuration options can be confusing and it's easy to get some of them wrong. The Mosaic dataset configuration script available from Esri is a configurable scripted option to create and recreate Mosaic datasets. It's both simple um, and quite sophisticated. It can create um, the original Mosaic datasets and derived and published Mosaic datasets, etc. Whenever we add rasters to the Mosaic dataset, we want fields to be calculated in the attribute table that can later be used to search for these rasters and filter them. Therefore, we use um, the Mosaic dataset creation con configuration script to derive fields like the date and time for a raster from the raster's name. Other things can be done in MDCS, um, such as adding indices and even publishing the dataset after creation. So I, I really encourage everyone who works with Mosaic datasets a lot to have a look at this um, script from Esri. I just wanted to briefly, very briefly summarize that the Mosaic dataset that I've been talking about is a really sophisticated container and the image service is its companion to web enable your data. A couple of resources. Um, I hope that I've been able to inspire you to work with raster data in ArcGIS Enterprise. When you work with imagery or scientific rasters in ArcGIS, either on the desktop or the web, these could be helpful, especially the link, the topmost link which runs a search for items in ArcGIS Online that are owned by the imagery workflows team will return a number of highly important links, among them the Mosaic dataset configuration script, information about working with MRF and LERC compression, as well as many examples. Well, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions about the Scenes app or the data management behind it, please do get in touch with us. Thank you.
So that was a great overview and a very comprehensive story um, of how NIWA is, um, well, first of all, managing all that data, uh, but also then leveraging uh, the image services to make uh, all that multidimensional data uh, imagery available. And you mentioned some of the resources, um, the, and you can find them on the resources section um, on the virtual platform as well. So links to uh, the different formats, MRF, CRF, the optimized rest tools, and the Mosaic dataset creation script. And you also find um, uh, the uh, imagery workflows there as well. So both, um, Tillman and Peter talked about ways to make imagery accessible, uh, basically to a wider group of users and applications uh, by creating the, uh, image services. And also about how you can accompany them uh, with the rest of functions. And in RGS, there are many ways that you can publish uh, your imagery to the web. Uh, and basically what you choose depends on the end user needs and the control that they need uh, over the source data or the access that they need to the source data. So first of all, uh, you can create uh, a tile case of your rest of product or the result of your analysis. You can publish that to RGS Online or RGS Enterprise. And that's a relatively easy way to publish uh, imagery. Um, it doesn't give you access to um, the source uh, data. So you can't really use it in, um, in your analysis. Uh, you can also create a raster cache uh, to be used uh, as a cache elevation layer, a layer that basically underpins uh, or creates the elevation for your uh, 3D applications. Another way to publish uh, image, uh, imagery or publish a mosaic data set is from RGS Pro. And that gives you a lot of control over the underlying mosaic data set capabilities and also on the image surface settings. So you, have, uh, you also have great flexibility over uh, where you would like uh, to store the data. And that can be local to the server, uh, or it can be um, in a native cloud storage like Azure or uh, S3. And again, for this as well, you find some great workflows and tools on uh, the Azure website that helped you uh, manage and publish that data most efficiently. Another way, a third way, uh, that's available since RGS Enterprise 10.7 is that you can publish hosted imagery layers uh, through the portal interface. Um, the, the data that you uh, use can be coming from either a local folder or you upload it, um, or it can be coming from an RGS data store, which uh, can then uh, reference a cloud native storage as well. So this is an easy way uh, to publish imagery, but it gives you a little less control over the underlying mosaic data set and the service capabilities. However, with the latest releases, you now have more control over these settings. Um, I would now like to have a look at this workflow. Starting from RGS Enterprise 10.7, you can register user managed data stores. And these data stores can be folders, databases, or native cloud stores. And we can use these to publish layers uh, from them, like imagery layers. And when we create a new imagery layer, we're taken to a step-by-step -step workflow to publish the imagery layer as an image surface. We first select the layer type, in this case, an image collection. And then we select the raster type, and you'll find presets for a wide range of imagery raster types. You can also set properties. In this case, we specify the source and uh, that the source type is elevation, and we want the output spatial reference uh, to be NZTM. And then we will select the images for this image layer. And we can upload images from our computer or select images from a data store. And in this case, the images are stored in Azure Blob Storage. And we select a folder with the already optimized MRF images. And finally, we'll enter item details like title, text, and description. And then the layer will be created. And this creation will take a while, so let's skip to a layer that I've already published. On the items details page, 
you can go to the image management tab where you can perform additional tasks like build footprints and overviews, uh, compute seam lines and calculate statistics. And on the settings tab, you can set some settings for the image layer. And I'd uh, like to highlight the raster functions here. Because you can add raster functions that are shared to your portal. And these raster functions will then be accessible from the layer in the map. So if we look at the map, we can see that it's visualized as a shaded relief, but we can easily change it uh, to be visualized as contours. And we can also add more advanced raster function chains to this. So this is one of the ways you can publish image services to ArcGIS Enterprise. Yeah, and it's a, it's a real powerful, uh, powerful way as well, um, making it, making the workflow a little bit easier. So now how can you use uh, that imagery? So first of all, when you publish your data as an image service, um, you can easily share it through the portal. Uh, you can share it with others inside or outside your organization um, or to applications, making dissemination of imagery data much easier uh, than I don't know, sharing large, uh, large set of, uh, of data, <coughs> uh, shipping it on, uh, on local hard drives, for example. And those layers, you can use them inside RGS Pro uh, inside native apps, web applications. Um, uh, it also comes with the uh, capabilities. So if you publish uh, a large data set uh, as an image service, you can allow end users to filter out a specific uh, image, for example, from a collection of satellite, uh, satellite scenes. Or you can change the vis visualization by using a combination of bands uh, or use them in analysis. So, and a very for a very powerful way, as we just heard, uh, is to do that through raster functions. Um, so uh, like Peter said, uh, RGS comes with over 160 raster functions out of the box that, uh, that you can use in RGS Pro and RGS Enterprise. And you can use raster functions to quickly change the visualization of your imagery. For example, visualize it by a vegetation index or for elevation data, show it as a hill shade, slope or contours. And you can take it further by creating raster function chains and here you can combine multiple input resters uh, and raster functions into a raster analysis workflow, creating an on-the-fly output. For example, by combining, the, like we see here, the vegetation index, uh, elevation, and rainfall data, you can create a landslide sus uh, susceptibility model. And then there's also apps and widgets uh, specifically created to work with imagery. So in order, to, uh, it allows you to change the visualization, do analysis uh, on the fly, or uh, select a specific image from a mosaic. And some of those you saw uh, mentioned in Thomas' presentation as well. Another app is uh, RGS Excalibur, and that is a web-based app, and it supports many imagery, uh, imagery workflows. And I would now like to switch to our next uh, user story, <clears throat> uh, and that is Ian Campion, and he works at the uh, Environment Canterbury, and he's a team leader of the spatial services there. He deals with a lot of uh, imagery, uh, data uh, like aerial imagery, elevation data, and he will talk about how uh, ECAM is managing all the data and some of the challenges that come with that, and I'll also talk about uh, all the LiDAR that is coming, uh, coming in, uh, is being flown now in the next few years. Tina Koto, no Angara ho, no Campion ho, no Riva, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Koto. Hello, I'm Ian Campion, I work for Environment Canary. Um, I look after the geospatial services here at, um, in Christchurch for Canary. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the rise of big data. Um, I've got uh, two um, subjects to talk about. One about a project that we have here at ECAN um, exploring big data opportunities um, and also I'll talk to you about 
um, the Provincial Growth Fund PG Fighter um, probably hopefully heard of that and so um, talk to you about the opportunity Sam New Zealand has with that. Um, so the Big Data Opportunity Project is a partnership um, with ECAN and its partners. We have um, all the district councils work together with a um, platform called Canary Maps. Hopefully you've heard about that. Um, and the goal for um, us for this project is to look at how we're doing um, our big data. So the big big data that we have um, in the geospatial era is um, historic imagery, which um, we've been helping Lynn's um, scan all historical imagery. Uh, we also have a yearly program uh, for aerial photography. Um, that's typically um, every year we capture a big um, collection and we also have event um, based as well um, and LIDAR is the same. Um, those ones in the orange box are pretty much um, all done in partnership across um, the whole district with the other councils um, and with LINS, um, mostly all licensed under Creative Commons. Um, so there's lots of data that we have, it's a very valuable resource that we have. We also, within our business plus those other um, businesses, you know, have <coughs> drone imagery in the league. So we have a lot of data that um, that we have within the business. So just to sort of show you the, the amount of data that we have for, um, so we have around about 50 terabytes in that um, orange box um, with about 18 terabyte to come plus five terabyte each year sort of growth. Um, and some of the the, the data that we have is priceless, um, like historical imagery, we can't give that back. And then every year when we capture historical, uh, sorry, imagery, it becomes historic eventually. Um, and so it's worth quite a lot of money as well. Um, so you'll see some estimates around six million maybe for historical imagery, eight million for the aerial imagery that we've captured over the time. Um, and also, you know, we've been capturing LIDAR and now with the PGF, which I'll talk about later got $4.8 million worth potentially coming in four years. So again, we've been capturing a lot of LIDAR and so it's all worth quite a lot of money. We also, within our business and the other businesses, capture drones um, and oblique imagery. Um, we've been doing a little bit in satellite, not much, so uh, that will potentially um, increase. Um, and spatial data, which is hard to put a money on, which is again sort of priceless. So we have a lot of data. Um, it's only ever going to increase um, as you know uh, the specifications get better, um, other um, uh, sensors come online and sort of hyperspectral and all sorts of other sensors that are available now and will be, you know, I can only see the data growth go up, not down. Um, so our sort of initial drivers for this project was um, these sort of four aspects. We, we wanted to um, have a look at our infrastructure and see, you know, what sort of we're missing out on opportunities in terms of new tech that can provide. Um, we typically are having, we believe, uh, processes that are outdated and inefficient um, and they don't really adhere to best practice, although we're probably best practice in terms of the traditional way that we've been doing it um, up and down the country compared to others. Um, but we think we can leapfrog um, one more um, step again. And then, you know, with the products that we're providing, are we actually providing um, what our customers actually want? So we sort of got, and we wanted to do this in collaboration with um, several um, uh, other parties as well in terms of our partners um, and also our um, other partners like Lynn's. So, you know, uh, are we putting the brakes on innovation with our infrastructure? Um, it is currently quite costly, um, and so we need to sort of move more into cloud type um, environment. Um, are we mi mixing our um, uh, our products? Are, you know, are we doing the right products for our customers? Are there any opportunities there? So that's what we're trying to do. 
with the project, we're going through a, a series of um, uh, phases, and so we've already done our current state. We're going to look at sort of future state that a customer wants. We're just currently doing sort of a, a technology focus, um, and then we'll also be once we've done these different um, states or phases, um, we're going to be doing some rec a recommendation, and then hopefully go into a sort of a implementation um, phase. So, what is the um, what is the opportunity that we see? Um, so at the moment, um, Environment Cannery with the Cannery Maps Partnership, you know, we do hold all the data. Um, our partners traditionally also hold that data and store it, which, you know, we want to challenge and, and see if we can um, minimise some costs because costs are rising. So there's a little bit of duplication of time that um, we see. We share it um, out to the public and to our other, you know, partners that potentially use our software or our, sorry, our um, software and services. Um, so, but technology is getting way better to be connected. So we, we think um, we can actually reduce some of that costs and, and simplify it as well. Um, when you look at, you know, that this might be what we're trying to do, re remove that raw cost and have a shared platform within Cannery and the TA partners, um, and then potentially put some automation in, in that uh, typical information flow. What about if we look at, um, you know, the industry as a whole, because potentially that same thing's happening, you know, in terms of our government partners, um, so LINs and um, the other um, ministries that store and want this information. So, yeah, maybe we can actually help there. And, you know, we've also got industry partners like Eagle that are potentially doing the same thing. So that's sort of the opportunity that we see that we might be able to... Um, reduce the complexity, um, look at the process that, um, how we provide services and simplify that as well. And there's been some quite good stuff that's been going on at Linz and um, Eagle. How, to, how can we um, work together actually to make that um, work? We're sort of getting inspired by, you know, the examples in the satellite space, you know. They have massive pressures in terms of information coming off daily with daily images. We don't have that, but we are getting massive data sets. And so some of the challenges is they've already been able to um, have to scale up because of the frequency and, and the amount of data. We can take some um, feathers out of their sort of cap in terms of how they've done it. And so we're looking to that as well. Um, so maybe, you know, this might be the, the spot where um, we may be still storing some information um, and maybe government is storing some information for us and then industry and our partners um, can all get access to that and process it with different um, uh, outcomes in mind. And so then everyone can sort of move up the value stream and actually just work on the value added products rather than this basic sort of stuff. So that's kind of one of the opportunities we see. Um, the, the other thing is that we, what we currently do with our imagery is it's quite complex. So we have satellite, rural, urban, and image and symmetry imagery, all different specs and specifications, um, all up and down Canterbury. And so that, that represents about 105 collections, um, which then go into one single mosaic. So we have 104 mosaics, and they all get derived into one mosaic. So it's quite complex. That's just for the latest imagery. Um, and you've got to sort of think about, um, we have the same thing, but for historic. So as imagery um, gets captured and it goes from um, uh, this year to next year, it starts to become historic. And so we have some a lot of collections and it's you know quite complex. We do all this in-house on our current infrastructure in the cloud, manual process, a lot of lag time. So yeah, how can, how can we improve that? Um, so, so far in the project, what we've um, know so far is that potentially it's not set up for innovation the way that we provide uh, imagery and LIDAR. Um, so, you know, you would have heard about terms like data lake and data engineering, um, data science and machine learning. It's not really set up for that, and so we need to think about that. Um, we pretty much know that we think that duplication can be reduced. We know that it's not, da not data analysis ready is currently how we, we do our imagery. Um, 
And also, you know, our customers' needs are also quite complex and they're evolving as well. Um, we think um, that we can take the learnings from satellite imagery and apply it to our, to our problem. Um, we also think the provision of this data would likely suit, you know, a federated model. Um, and so that's something we're going to try to um, work through. We haven't got all the answers at the moment, but it's kind of a shared industry for us, um, government and, and our partners to work through. So that gives you a bit of an insight in terms of that project we've got going on in Canterbury. And it kind of ties into, the, um, I suppose, what I'm next going to talk to you about, which is um, the PGM LIDAR. So this is where regional government and LIMS have been working together. Um, the current partners are these partners here. Um, so they're up and down the country and they're part of the first um, tranche in terms of that was um, occurring. Second one's occurring right now. Um, in terms of the PGF, so what is PGF? So in October 2018, government announced $19 million co-funding, part of the Provincial Growth Fund. Um, and so the goal really is to improve the national LIDAR data set. So the elevation data set is so old um, and not as accurate as what people should be having these days in terms of modern data sets. You know, there's a lots of um, things that this LIDAR enables, you know, in terms of, you know, smarter investment across New Zealand, in terms of infrastructure, forestry, there's the central flood risk mapping, climate change um, impacts and so there's a big environmental part, but there's also lots of other you know, primary and cultural stuff. Um, and so this has sort of mapped out some of the some of the areas that you can use it for. And I believe it's an untapped resource that um, currently the industry is not probably making the best use of. Um, just to show you um, the depth and richness of the, the LIDAR that we're capturing, this is just showing you the difference between the eight meter DEM and what the PG fund will um, unlock. So you can see there's quite a big difference um, and you'll see it looks like two roads there in the, in the uh, image, but in fact that's actually a railway corridor and you can just see that it goes under the road, it's not on top of the road, you just you can see the difference that it will make. Um, plus there's a richness in terms of the data, so this will just show you quickly, you know, the point cloud, that you get from this and potentially what we can untap, you know, we can tap a whole lot of data from that. Um, so I'll just turn that on now and you can see, you can see the vegetation, you can automatically pull that sort of da those data sets out. You can see how it pulled out the, the roof line, the ground returns, the road. So there's all this rich information there that could be right for innovation. So, you know, the road to full coverage in New Zealand well, you can see the green areas are already being, um, our existing areas that have been taken under other programs. Um, the tranche one is the orange. Um, and then there is a second tranche that's happening right now. Um, but this, those um, uh, yellow sort of hatched areas are the areas that are getting um, done now, part of the first one. Um, and also you'll see some areas like Canterbury, um, Auckland already had, and uh, Bay of Plenty and other areas already had existing um, imagery to the spec. So we do have some challenges ahead of us. Um, so the th three sort of major challenges that we see at regional government is that we need to ensure that the data that is contracted is um, accurate and fit for purpose, um, which is a big job, and so I'll about what we're going to do about that. Um, there's also at the end of the project and also during the project, we want to make sure that people, the industry um, and, and us, our partners, all realise the benefits of this great data that we're going to be um, capturing. And then sort of the biggest challenge we see is actually um, storing this data in a sustainable and accessible way, you know, for the future and for a modern um, technique to actually advantage of it. So um, what are we doing about it? Well the sort of for the first challenge um, we uh, we've got this project uh, team together to work on the quality assurance side of it so you know ensuring that the data is accurate fit for purpose and the major outcomes that we're looking to achieve 
recipes that obviously the data and the derivatives out of that meet you know agreed um, QA standard um, and that they can be merged into a seamless uh, national data set and also you know the ongoing capture and utilization program which has available um, process tools and documentation and so this is sort of we see this as not as a once uh, um, potentially if you other areas where you need to recapture LIDAR um, for certain particular purposes and so what we do with this big program of work needs to be re-learnt and, and, and reused and in the same vein um, expertise you know built up within our councils and all the other regional councils and the industry um, in particular you know it's maintained within New Zealand so some of the goals you know, we want to have a you know single LIDAR and derivative quality assurance standard um, that everyone just understands and agrees. Um, the quality standards apply consistently. Um, all the data received and derivatives um, are all agreed um, and captured in a timely fashion against that standard. Um, and we also want to make sure that you know we've got expertise around LIDAR and the derivatives, not just in the councils, but also uh, the regional councils, but the district councils, and all throughout the, the industry. Um, the default sort of process that we usually do with uh, when we keep LIDAR is a little bit um, inefficient and, and it's disconnected. These data sets that are coming from hard drives or other um, methods. Uh, we never know, potentially data gets um, found that there's errors and it gets updated, who's got the right data set. Quite costly in terms of the time, um, also the storage, a lot of it's manual. Um, so it's not really um, meeting our end needs. So part of um, partnership with Land Information New Zealand, we established a working group. And this working group is a great start that, um, to basically work on these issues. And we've agreed a QA standard. There's still a little bit more work that needs to be done in this whole space. Um, we've agreed potentially how the data is going to come into the councils um, or how, how it eventually will come into the regional councils um, and also how it's going to get processed. We're starting to establish some really good test suites and so Linz have helped us with that and they've got a great um, base test suite. And we're trying to work out how can we test some of the, um, the cases that we want to check for that's not you know, as automatic as we, we can. And we've been doing some sort of partnerships with other organisations to help us with that. One of them, you know, Easy Technologies. Um, and then you know, we want to go out and consult and inform with all our stakeholders in terms of what we need to be doing. Um, so yes, some of the challenges for the QA process is around you know the scale. It is massive compared to what we typically do in a council. So the large files, lots of them, um, the sharing via hard drives, just too slow. And there's so many people who need to be able to get access to this data. Um, who's got the corrected data? You know, is the sort of is the issue. So we really want one source of the truth. Um, we want whatever we're doing to be repeatable and scalable. Um, and we had, you know, a lack of sort of QA standards and expertise, and so we're working on that. Um, and traditional sort of on-premise storage is just a bit too costly for this. Um, and, and so we're looking at potentially um, cloud um, type technologies, which I'll talk about in the third challenge um, here. Um, so we have, um, got some external help um, with this to sort of establish some test suites and tool sets. There's still a lot more work to be done on it, but you, there's an element of um, some of the tests can be automated, um, but some of it needs to have um, a human <laughs> to actually um, look and, and find some of the issues. Um, and because of that process, we can't have hard drives flying around the country to check these. Um, we need to, it to be able to be quick and fast to access this information. Um, plus, so that sort of leans us towards, you know, in the cloud, it needs to be, we believe, sort of more of, you know, one seamless data set is our goal, so why would we keep it sort of separate? And we want to have feedback to a wide testing group so we can catch um, potential issues and, and sort them out um, at source. 
And part of that is to integrate um, Lynn's fundamental test suite, which they've been developing for us in terms of um, testing the glider. So these are some of the pitches to sort of get your um, understanding. You know, we'll be using other data sets to test it, like with building outlines. Um, it may be web-based and also tools-based like Art Pro and our other, other um, tool sets. And hopefully we'll get um, one view on the progress and, and how it's going, you know, how many issues have declined in terms of QA um, issues and whatnot. Um, the second challenge is yeah, storing this data in a sustainable and accessible way. And, and that is um, a big challenge and we're looking for cloud solutions potentially for that. Um, still don't know what we don't know yet. Um, but we see it sort of underpins, you know, the innovation of this data set. Um, the QA process is going to work better with it. Um, hopefully accessibility for other organisations long term will be um, be able to um, access this. And that's kind of where it gets into this benefits realisation piece that um, for this really to work, storage is a key component um, of the challenge. Uh, what's also happening is in partnership with um, the regional government and um, other uh, with Lynn, and this is initiated by Lynn's um, other government departments, is uh, there's a project about to start called 3D Mapping Aotearoa. Um, and so this is to try to untap, you know, that benefits that everyone can get um, because we believe LIDAR is not being utilised as well as it can be um, and people don't understand the um, uses that they can do it and so we want to improve the discoverability and the access and for them to understand what this and so you know it's estimated that potentially you know 24 to 260 million dollars per year that can be gained in terms of benefits and so we want to be able to work out what those stories are to actually um, underpin and go back to central government so they actually understand the value of this data set from the Kulon Inc. Um, because potentially, um, I think, our, especially in Canterbury, we've got um, massive LIDAR already and we're going to be even having more. Um, we need to make sure that we're utilising this great asset. Um, so there'll be hopefully a lot happening in this space. Um, hopefully um, what I've shown you today is um, going to inspire you to watch out um, for when these data sets start coming online. Um, and, and you know, if, if there is an opportunity for you to um, get involved in uh, any work that's in this space, I do encourage you to get involved because it's, um, it's an exciting new area. Um, and New Zealand's going to have this massive national asset that we can uh, take advantage. So thank you very much and um, hope you enjoy the conference. Thanks for that, uh, Ian. That was a great story. It also shows there's a lot more to managing imagery, uh, especially in this era when uh, we see a lot of imagery coming our way. And it's great to be working with them to find the best solution for this. But it also shows um, that all the LiDAR that will, come, uh, that will come in will be of great benefit uh, to New Zealand all across, uh, all across sectors. And now I want to uh, switch to uh, content. And that is especially imagery that is available to you, imagery where you don't have to worry about managing it uh, as that has already been taken care of. And you can just tap into it and use it in your own work. And uh, ArcGIS comes with the ArcGIS Living Atlas and that is the largest collection of geospatial data in the world. And part of that is imagery. And I would like to highlight a couple uh, of layers here that you can use right now in your work. So first off, there's the base map. Um, both Esri and Eagle provide imagery base maps for the world, uh, Esri for the world and uh, Eagle for New Zealand in NZTM. And the New Zealand imagery base map is created from the best available publicly owned imagery and is updated frequently. Uh, it's the most used base map uh, that we offer and it's great if you need imagery as a contextual layer. But in the Living Atlas you also find satellite layers like Sentinel-2 and Landsat. And these are multispectral uh, satellite images that are uh, ready to use. 
and it's published with raster functions. So you can easily visualize them to show, for example, a burn index, a vegetation index, or moisture index. And it also holds a lot of history. So Sentinel goes back 13, uh, 13 or 14 months, and uh, the full uh, data set of Landsat is available as well. And then there's also layers that are derived from satellite. For example, the various thermal hotspot and fire activity layer. And uh, that's showing you where thermal hotspots are in the world. And on the image uh, here on the bottom uh, left, you can see the fire activity around the fires near, Twi uh, near Twizel. And apart from data that's available in the Living Atlas, there's also a range of commercial suppliers of imagery. Uh, commercial uh, suppliers that fly uh, airplanes or have satellites. And a few, a few of those sources we can give you access to as well. And uh, one of them is NearMap, and they provide very high resolution aerial images for large parts uh, of New Zealand focused on urban areas. Um, and depending on the region, it's flown once or twice a year. And they are actually a gold sponsor of these events. So you can go check them out uh, in the sponsor tab of this platform. Now we have Maxar, uh, provides high resolution multiband satellite imagery, great for doing analysis. And Esri has just formed a new partnership with Planet um, to be able to resell Planet. And they provide uh, base maps, but also multispectral images. And they also come with an RGS Pro plugin, so you can easily get the images uh, that you need within RGS Pro. And if you need any information on this, feel free uh, to reach out. And with uh, that section, we've almost come to the end of our imagery session, uh, but not until we've heard from Peter Becker from Esri what you can expect on imagery in the near future. Next, what I wanted to quickly do is just have a quick look at the road ahead. Um, you know what's coming up next with imagery. It's really just one slide, just a quick overview um, from an image management perspective. Uh, I've mentioned before ArcGIS online imagery um, that's currently in private beta. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in joining that, uh, do, do get in contact with, with Esri and we can try and get you onto, the, onto that program. Um, there's a lot more coming up with oriented imagery. I've mentioned that before, the ability to work with things like terrestrial imagery and oblique imagery, um, and, you know, 360 imagery. So a lot of that already exists and you'll see more of that coming. Um, from the map production of imagery, there's some really exciting things coming along in how we're going to be able to work and create new products from imagery. Then there's image analysis, um, lots of enhancements going on to further improve the um, things like change detection, uh, obviously improvements coming up in the deep learning. We're always doing a lot of development on that area. And then from the visualization exploitation area, uh, lots of improvements in um, the map viewer, um, how that works with you know, not only the tiled imagery and the dynamic imagery within the services, enabling you to perform different types of analysis and that and directly from the map viewer. Support for the tiled imagery, which is really the streaming of these images back to the client applications. Improvements in the configuration templates that I've mentioned earlier. Experience Builder, and hopefully you've started seeing and working with Experience Builder, and you will see a lot of the new imagery capabilities coming to the Experience Builder. So that's going to be very, very nice. And then adding also oriented imagery um, into various applications. So you'll see a lot more of oriented imagery coming into applications and, uh, and enabling you to do things like deep learning and things like that. So that's just a very quick, quick look at what's coming. Lots of exciting things, um, certainly. Um, Hopefully you're going to enjoy the rest of the, the, the conference that you're at. And um, yeah, if you have questions, I'm sure somebody's going to be available to answer. If not, do go and have a look at that website that I showed you before. And uh, um, otherwise, look at things like GeoNet or get directly in contact us, in contact with us, and we'll get you the answers. Okay, so have a good time. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, so that's pretty much all we had. I just have one quick announcement, uh, and that is the Eagle looking to host an imagery workshop that is upcoming. Um, this workshop will look to cover workflows managing large amounts of energy, um, as you saw uh, Ian go through as well. Um, some of the Esri best practices to enable those workflows, um, some local and international examples of who's doing it well, um, as well as facilitating discussion between participants about common issues they face. Um, if you are interested at all, or your organization might be interested, uh, please do reach out to your respective account manager or us at Eagle ourselves, um, and we can go from there. But that is all we had for now. Um, if you do have any questions, unfortunately we don't have time to get to them today, 
Um, sorry about that, but we will get to them um, over the next two weeks and we will definitely send uh, responses back to you. If you do want to rewatch these sessions at any point over the next two weeks, feel, please feel free and you can ask further questions if you need to. Um, but thank you to all our presenters, uh, Ian Campion, uh, Tillman Steinmetz from Niwa and Peter Becker from Esri, as well as my colleague Valdivan and our AV team, John. Um, hope you enjoyed the virtual conference um, and we will see you again face-to-face -face very soon, hopefully. But cheers.